Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Cynthia Greenberg with the National Partnership for New Americans and the National Immigrant Integration Conference. We want to welcome all of you to our the final in our series of webinars, uh, follow-up conversations to this year's National Immigrant Integration Conference, which wrapped up in October in Las Vegas. Today's topic is a very urgent one. Um, it's the modern anti-immigrant movement, the scope of the threat and what we can do about it. And we're very proud to be hosting this conversation today with our longtime partners at Unidos US and the Migrant, Immigrant, and Refugee Rights Alliance. So with that, I'm very honored to introduce our co-host and moderator for today's important conversation, Lola Ibrahim, the Executive Director of the MIR Alliance. Um, uh, Lola will be guiding us through today's conversation, as well as taking um, some questions at the end. So we thank you all. And I did also just want to mention that if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A function, um, and we will be sure to pick them up there. So with that, Lola, I turn it to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia, and welcome to all our guests and our panelists, and thank you for joining today's conversation. Um, I'm Lola Ibrahim, as Cynthia mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of Mir Alliance, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion with our three distinguished panelists, Devin Burkhardt, Executive Director of the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights, Heidi Byrick, co-founder of the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, and Hassan Ahmad, immigration attorney based in Northern Virginia. So a big welcome to you all. Um, and I look forward to an informative and dynamic 75 minutes together, which will consist of discussion with our panelists followed by audience Q&A. So please drop your questions in the Q&A box as they come up and we will do our best to address them at the end. So, um, again, also, I'd like to echo my thanks to the partners and collaborators who put this session together, uh, not only for their efforts on this event, but also for the work that they do on behalf of immigrants in this country every day. So let's get started. Um, we are here because we want to better understand and expose the dangers of the modern anti-immigrant movement. Um, and what do we mean when we say movement and who are we really talking about? We know that it's an entire ecosystem that comprises this movement. It includes media outlets, it includes think tanks, extremist groups, um, elected officials, and much, much more. So what we're keen on unearthing today are who are those key protagonists? How are they influencing immigration policy at the highest levels? So let's get some answers. Um, I would like to start with uh, Devin Burkhardt for some framing. Devin, if you wouldn't mind, um, if you can help us understand the process of political socialization and radicalization, not only how it takes shape, but how far right extremism manages uh, to successfully influence our immigration system. Tell us how that happens. Well, you know, that's a great question. I think it's uh, an important way to think about the process of radicalization is that it doesn't happen in a vacuum and that we're all influenced by our the ecosystem around us. And unfortunately today, thanks to social media, the kinds of bubbles that have been created around individuals are often really self-limiting. And so what happens is uh, we often describe this process as a kind of conveyor belt where someone may be interested or concerned about immigration because of something going on in their community or something that they've read. Um, they are introduced to the network of organizations we'll be talking about today. And then they are very quickly these days drawn down a conveyor belt um, that that rapidly moves them from the standard issue of concern that they had to being more ideologically motivated and expanding their base of support beyond narrow concerns about immigrants um, to a much broader um, position of white nationalism. Even some go so far as to being willing to take up arms uh, and commit acts of violence. So it's a continuum of activity. And I think what was really important was what you said in the beginning, that we should focus on this as a movement, right? That it, with all its component parts. So that means I think it's important for us to examine um, the ground forces, you know, think about that as kind of an onion. There are those core activists who have bought in completely and will spend 24 seven 
campaigning and activating for uh, anti-immigrant activities. And then there are those who are supporters, you know, those who give money to campaigns, buy literature, attend meetings, vote for candidates. And then there are sympathizers, you know, those you can gauge by public opinion polls. And we know over the past years that that is a rapidly changing, often dynamic situation. You know, those situations are impacted by the those groups using the airwaves and social media to impact it. So, you know, like my friend Zach over at America's Voice is doing an amazing job of tracking radio, television so, and social media ad buys and the ways they're impacting it. And then there's the political fight. All of these are being supported and driven by um, a massive war chest that these organizations have developed over the past 50 years in moving these ideas from the margins to the mainstream. Thank you, Devin. Um, Heidi, this is not a new movement. Um, it has a long history of undermining and stymieing our immigration system, and yet it feels renewed in this moment. It feels different. Um, how ha is the face of the of anti-immigrant extremism changing in this particular moment, and why? Um, thank you so much, Lola. Thanks to Mira Alliance, Unidos, MPNA, everybody who who put this together. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, it's it, it's interesting how you frame that question that it that it feels new. What I feel about the anti-immigrant movement is it feels bigger. I was listening to the, the onion that, that um, Devin just described. And when I started looking at anti-immigrant extremist groups, you know, about 20 some years ago, it was a much more limited field. We had the big players that we have today, the ones that are connected to John Tanton, who was the architect of a, a big piece of, you know, America's anti-immigrant movement and who was a white nationalist and i'm talking about the federation for american immigration reform the center for immigration studies and numbers usa as main players for many decades now in in an effort to demonize immigrants and to make sure that people understand that they're culturally inappropriate they don't belong here ultimately this is just a white nationalist argument that america should be for white people and everybody else is somehow subpar and doesn't belong you know, 20, 25 years ago, those organizations were uh, powerful. They were fighting at that time in California to, as that, as that state was going through a demographic, demographic transition like, like the United States is today, they were playing the role of um, pushing anti-immigrant legislation. They were working with eugenicists and white nationalists to try to uh, basically punish the Latino population in California, they allied themselves with politicians, people like Pete Wilson, Republicans, in an effort to, I guess, try to stop the change that was coming and demonize um, more recent Americans, Americans who had come more recently to, to the country. That's now a nationwide effort. And we still have FAIR and CIS and Numbers USA playing a very important role in policy. They were very close to uh, people in the Trump administration, like uh, Stephen Miller, for example, the Center for Immigration Studies was directly um, responsible for, for example, the Muslim ban under the Trump administration, but a lot of other horrible things. But, but that's only like one little piece of the pie, as Devin was explaining about what we're facing today in terms of an anti-immigrant movement or ecosystem. There are also the white supremacists. Some of the people who invaded the Capitol on January 6th are wildly anti-immigrant. There have been various other political formations like the Tea Parties, which Devin is an absolute expert at, that have arisen on the right in recent years and that have been fueled by anti-immigrant sentiment. And now we also have sections of the uh, Republican Party, unfortunately, that are motivated by these whole ideas. So. There were particular organizations that have really pushed the anti-immigrant agenda and sort of a location where it started, but it's really big today, unfortunately. And that is part of the reason why we haven't seen any real successful attempt to even try to reform our system since like 2013. That's the sad state of affairs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heidi. I think it's, it's really helpful how you and Devin are framing uh, those connections so that we could really see this uh, as a groundswell um, 
of many different actors and agents. So thank you for that. And Hassan, I'd like to turn to you for a moment. Um, this movement has very sinister origins, right? Racist, eugenicist beliefs that have shaped the ideology. And this includes the particular efforts of a man Heidi just named by the name of John Tanton, whom you know quite a bit about. Um, can you tell us about him and what you've been doing to expose his ideology? Absolutely, and thank you to Mira Lance and Unidos and, and Pina. It, these, these are all great groups and a, and a very necessary conversation. Um, <clears throat> I came to this uh, not as an advocate, but just as, a, as an immigration attorney, a practitioner. I started practicing in the wake of 9-11 and uh, started to see uh, my job get harder and harder and harder. Um, more and more anti-immigrant laws, things that were uh, available to my clients in years past were uh, systematically, it seemed, being taken away. Um, and I got curious uh, when, um, when Trump was elected uh, as to where this was coming from. Um, I started to smell the onion, if, that's, if I can <laughs> continue on with this onion uh, metaphor here. Um, Again, I was coming at it from a practitioner standpoint, just sort of uh, understanding that, uh, or observing that my, my job was getting harder. Um, and when I started investigating and started to look at the origin of the laws that I was fighting on a daily basis, whether it was the 10 year bar or you know, TPSD designation, January, 2017, of course, the Muslim ban, um, the fight over DACA, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, SB 1070, you know, back in Arizona in 2010, uh, all of these, uh, all roads led back to John Tanton. Um, and as I started to learn, uh, I started to learn more about uh, the Tanton network, about how these organizations formulated not only the policy, which turned into law, but co-opted the debate, the way we even talk about immigration, uh, and one point that I, I, I make often, uh, think about the debate that we're having, just say over dreamers today, right? Uh, shall we grant citizenship to people who were brought here uh, through no fault of their own? Um, to me, it's a no brainer. And it should have been something that was resolved a long time ago. Why is it that we're still having this debate over whether or not, why is it that deportation is always considered the only cure for a broken immigration law. What about the law itself? Where did it come from? Is it just? Should it, uh, should it be changed? And, and this is what led me down to, um, uh, to understand more about John Tanton. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here really quickly. Uh, you all should see my, my PowerPoint here. Uh, so I, I call it camouflaging white nationalism and John Tanton was the man behind it. And this was the picture. This was the picture that started it all. I don't know if you all remember this, but it was uh, Trump, uh, then president elect Trump uh, asking Chris Kobach, who's a well-known uh, tied into this organization, uh, tied into this network. Um, and he was making the case, Chris Kobach was to, uh, that he should run the Department of Homeland Security. And to me as a practicing attorney, I knew who Chris Kobach was uh, and I was very alarmed that people like him would be in the upcoming administration. So I started doing um, uh, some research and started finding out about John Tanton. And then I found that John Tanton had been, um, had donated his papers to the University of Michigan, um, his alma mater, 25 banker boxes worth and uh, boxes one through 14 were uh, publicly available, but he had somehow sealed boxes 15 through 25, University of Michigan being a public entity, I decided um, I decided to uh, file a Freedom of Information Act request in December of 2016, right after I saw this photo. Um, and I am now five years later, and uh, uh, we have been up to the Michigan Supreme Court and back, and currently in trial against the University of Michigan, who have resisted tooth and nail the unsealing of John Tanton's papers. Why are they so important? Because these papers, as the architect's papers, uh, will shed light or shed light on the conceptual and ideological underpinnings of this entire movement. Uh, it's a small part of the story, but I would submit 
a, an important part of the story uh, that for some reason has not yet seen the light of day. And that's what I've been after for five years now. Hmm. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you for sharing that and for your incredible work on this story that's unfolding that will um, inevitably unearth a lot of uh, secrets and realities about uh, the root causes of this um, anti-immigrant movement. Um, so I want to turn to Devin. Devin, um, one way to take power from this movement is to follow the money and to starve it of funding, so to speak. And your organization has done some really great work to track the funding for some of the groups that we've discussed here. Um, can you share with us a little bit about where that money comes from and what you've learned in that in that process? Yeah, thanks, Lola. And thanks again to, to Mira and to Nick and to Unidos for you know, allowing me to be here and talk about this. It's such an important topic. And, you know, following the money is really a challenge because they're so good at obfuscating it. And so much of it is actually parked, uh, is coming from philanthropic institutions, which if any of you have tried to, to follow the money in that way, it's a complex and challenging situation to try to unfold. Um, but we at the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights um, have, you know, dived in, and it started to examine it. And a new report we'll have out early next year called Anti-Immigrant Inc., the Philanthropic Support for the New Nativism, which looks at this nonprofit slice of the overall anti-immigrant picture. You know, the philanthropic world of so-called 501c3 nonprofit organizations upon which the new nativism was built. Um, you know, in following that money, uh, we found that these private foundations provided massive massive financial support to the movement over the years, over the last four decades in particular, you know, we found nearly 200 foundations have donated more than a quarter of billion dollars to 50 different anti-immigrant organizations over the years. Um, with that sizable war chest, those coffers have been filled with that generous foundation support. And though complete figures aren't available yet for even 2020, we uncovered in 2020 alone, these groups raised $23.8 million in foundation support. Um, that money supports millions of dollars in online and television advertising, influential national think tanks that cloak nativism in a wonky veneer for policymakers and providing ideological cohesion to the movement legal groups that reshape immigration policy in the courts, so-called English-only groups that use language issues to stir anti-immigrant sentiment, grassroots groups, including paramilitary vigilantes to stoke fear and mistrust, and front groups, groups uh, led by people of color or aimed at environmental constituents or conservative or progressive groups, all of these are used by the movement as wedges against pro-immigrant coalitions to try to stymie change on immigration policy and to divide and conquer. Um, that elaborate network has been really good at creating the illusion of widespread support for anti-immigrant policies and has had an amazingly outsized impact on American life for decades as they've moved, as Heidi said, you know, really rapidly from the margins to the mainstream and it expanded so dramatically. Thank you, Devin. Heidi, so many things that, um, that we think about as kind of happening in the back room in some dark corner or in private conversations are now becoming very public facing conversations. Um, and that includes things like the great replacement conspiracy theory, which I learned from you to call it a conspiracy theory. Um, can you tell us more about um, that particular idea and how it's um, shaping public uh, opinion and really seeping into the public imagination? Yeah, absolutely, Lola. I'm gonna steal the point that Devin just made about margins to the mainstream, because if ever, ever there was something that should not have made it way, its way from the margins to the mainstream, it would be the great replacement conspiracy theory. Uh, let me just define it for those who don't know what it is. This is, this is actually an idea created by a Frenchman that was exported to the United States. And what it argues is that white people in historically white countries 
are being quote unquote replaced by people of color, usually, usually immigrants. So it's a bit of a twisted history in which uh, extremists you know, are arguing that the United States somehow was a white country, which of course is not true of this country's history, and that immigration patterns are replacing those white people uh, with people who shouldn't be here and who are the wrong color. And in some iterations of this theory, it's also uh, put at the hands of Jews. So it becomes an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, right? Jews are bringing minorities into what traditionally white countries to replace those minorities and control the political system. That exact idea is what motivated the 2018 Tree of Life synagogue shooting. A lot of people don't realize that the man um, who committed that heinous act entered that synagogue because he was looking for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society offices. In other words, a, a project that, that helps refugees. And so he was both going after the Jew, Jewish population and immigrants. This same idea is behind the mosque attacks that occurred in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2019, the El Paso Walmart shooting, and quite a few other massacres around the world. So there are lone actors who have been radicalized into wanting to kill immigrants because they have sucked up this great replacement idea. That's all absolutely terrifying and horrific. What's more scary is that this isn't something that we're just hearing from a bunch of neo-Nazis on the web. We now have some pretty prominent people in the United States who have asserted that the Great Replacement Theory is actually not a conspiracy, but a real thing. And they include, for example, Fox News host Tucker Carlson, who has used this language quite a few times on his program. You know, he's got millions of viewers so all I can think of is this is mainstreaming white supremacy. Uh, Newt Gingrich, the former um, Speaker of the House, GOP Speaker of the House in the 1990s has been pushing this. And of course, then there is Stephen Miller, who is you know, a, perhaps most largely responsible for taking the ideas of the anti-immigrant movement and getting them turned into policy for his boss, uh, Donald Trump, when he was in office. We now also know that Stephen Miller has connections to a whole lot of white supremacist groups all on his own. But that means that an idea, a white supremacist idea, which is a conspiracy theory, it's not true, it's completely bogus and ridiculous and racist, has actually become accepted by parts of the conservative movement here in the US. This is something that has inspired mass violence and, and now prominent people like Tucker Carlson are are talking about it as it's fact. And it's it just boggles the mind how this could possibly be the case. It's it's astounding and horrifying. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, thank you, Heidi, for sharing that. Um, I wanna circle back to Hassan very quickly. Um, we, again, what we're doing a lot of today is we're referring to this as an ecosystem. We're highlighting its various parts. Um, and I'm curious to hear in your journey to unseal the Tantan papers and expose that ideology, what else have you discovered about the Tantan footprint? Um, who else uh, does it involve? Um, how has it seeped into the highest levels of government and through whom? Just can you help us kind of understand that uh, footprint and how um, influential it's been. Sure, thanks for the question, Lola. And <clears throat> it's, it really is an ecosystem, um, and you know any sort of ecosystem uh, or movement like this is going to require obviously policymakers. It's going to require a media megaphone. It's going to require the help of elected officials, all the way up and down the ballot. Uh, we're talking local races all the way up to the up to the White House. Um, it's going to require think tanks, people that actually can put out <clears throat> quote unquote studies. Um, and, uh, and, and published uh, uh, one-sided uh, you know, facts or cherry-picked uh, cherry data in order to push, push that agenda. And so uh, the Tantan Network encompasses all of these. And it's scary uh, reading through um, the extant archive in, in pages uh, boxes one through 14 to see the genesis of this movement. Uh, he wasn't... Um, perfect. He was he didn't do it, uh, you know, perfectly. He made a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, but he was a relentless fundraiser. He was always willing to talk to people, 
always willing to expand the network, um, meeting with the INS commissioner, for example, with his uh, uh, fair co-founder, Roger Connor in 1982, uh, the close friendship that he enjoyed with uh, Cordelia Scaife May, um, a, a Mellon family uh, heiress, uh, who walked that same line of environmentalist to white nationalist. And we can certainly talk about that as well. That's sort of John Tanton's own personal journey uh, towards uh, um, uh, first population control, then, well, certain populations being controlled to full-blown you know, white nationalism. Um, and uh, uh, the degree with which, and the degree of success, the outside success that, these organiza that his organizations had, they had the idea, for example, of decentralizing, right? So his flagship organization was started with a $50,000 gift from Cordy Scaife May in 1979, but later on grew to include the Center for Immigration Studies, Numbers USA, um, and, uh, and, and more recently groups like Progressives for Immigration Reform. All of them have Tantan ideology in their DNA. Uh, they're pushing a, 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 an agenda, a common agenda uh, of exclusion, and they utilize media megaphones, people like uh, Tucker Carlson, Lou Dobbs in the past, um, uh, to, uh, to, to propagate that message. They put out quote unquote facts and figures uh, through, uh, through think tanks such as the Center for Immigration Studies. Uh, they light up the switchboards on Capitol Hill through groups like Numbers USA. Um, they uh, shift their message depending on which community they're trying to target. Um, and they have the wherewithal the funding and the and the and the, and the boots on the ground, so to speak, uh, to come up with um, policy recommendations um, that inform an administration such as the Trump administration of where the buttons to press are and where the levers to pull are to convert the immigration law into a deportation machine. Thank you, Hassan certainly very interesting origin story and, and very important because of how far reaching it is and how, uh, how much it's influencing our, our politics. Um, back to Devin. So the pandemic exacerbated some of the conditions that give rise to these extremist elements. Um, can you help us understand that statement and how this moment has shifted sentiments towards um, immigration? Yeah, I think you know, in a lot of respects, the old school Tanton network uh, has taken a back seat during the pandemic because there's been uh, very little for them to do, partially because they've had so success, so much success over the last four years during the Trump administration at moving their agenda that they've largely um, left the ground game to other networks and organizations. Um, sadly, during the pandemic, um, that has been taken up by um, what we call COVID denial groups. These are the uh, reopen as soon as we can, anti-mask, anti-vaxxers, uh, conspiracy theorists um, that have developed online an entire ecosystem of their own to push back against COVID-19 health restrictions, um, you know, to try to end the pandemic. Um, those organizations have grown dramatically uh, during this year, uh, particularly during the last year. Uh, we released a report in October that found that on Facebook alone, there were more than 1,700 of these groups that had over 2.4 million people involved in them. And as we talked about earlier, they are one of those key places that's an early stepping stone onto that conveyor belt. So while many of them may have entered because they were concerned about the pandemic, now they're getting inundated daily with kind of anti-immigrant notions, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and others. So the ground has shifted under their feet as well as with our entire political process as a result of having these activated, mobilized, energetic groups of folks who are now engaging not only in political uh, fights, but also in doing things like blocking access to um, vaccine distribution sites, uh, attacking doctors, nurses, public health officials, uh, school employees, uh, school board meetings. Um, 
and really pushing the envelope of the level of political engagement to engaging in this kind of vigilante violence. So given that so many of the ideas incubated by Numbers USA, FAIR, CIS, and others are now being introduced into this activated COVID denial community, it means we've got a broader, bigger problem to deal with, and they have more potential recruits to sweep into their net when they begin moving and pushing back on immigration reform in the future. Thank you, Devin. And I think it's uh, also connected to the pandemic is, is how we've consumed information during this time. And someone earlier mentioned social media. Um, and I think of it as one of the main tools in the anti-immigrant toolbox. Um, Heidi, I've heard you talk about social media many times and, and um, online companies and how we have to hold them accountable for their role in allowing extremist and racist movements to thrive. Um, and that's another part of the ecosystem, right? So can you tell us how serious a threat this is and how anti-immigrant groups are using these platforms? Well, <laughs> the online ecosystem is just so massive. And the problem that we've had uh, when it comes to the online space is that it was essentially unregulated until sort of the weeks and months after the Charlottesville riots in 2017, which were kind of a wake up call for social media about their terms of service and how much racism and hate was on their platforms and so on. And they began to make some changes wholly inadequate. It doesn't really matter which platform you're talking about. And the, th the big thing about social media, this is also true of the web, is we're in a situation now where extremist materials are easily accessible. The radicalization you know, conveyor belt that Devin's talking about is you know, on a high speed setting because of what you're exposed to when you go online. You know, if you were looking to find out about some kind of an extremist group or even a group like FAIR in the 1990s, well, there wouldn't have been a website. There wouldn't have been a place to really find it. You probably wouldn't find something in the library. If it was a, a blatantly hateful group, they're not going to have a telephone entry in the yellow pages. So the, it was hard, right, to get exposed and to get radicalized. It, it wasn't impossible. People, of course, did. But what the, what the web did is it was just like a mass accelerant. Just it, it, it's almost hard to conceive how all this ugliness and hate and extremism was just injected into systems all across the world. It's not just about the United States. And we now have metastasizing extremism in many, many countries in the world rising levels of hate violence, hate crimes, far-right populist movements to target refugees and immigrants. I mean, all of this could not have been possible without social media. And I'll just use as a little teeny tiny example, those of us who remember Donald Trump on Twitter, mm -hmm. he retweeted QAnon conspiracies like a couple hundred times. He posted racist material over and over again, in particular when it comes to immigrants. Even right now, there are ads being run on Facebook that have rabidly anti-immigrant material in them that are being put out by people affiliated with the Trump campaign. He's he's banned right from Facebook, but there are there are the ads still. So you, you can't really talk about what to do about the conveyor belt, about the radicalization or about this movement without thinking about the online world and how it it just proliferates these things. I have to say, if John Tanton had been alive in the era of Twitter and Facebook, I don't know what this world would be like because he would have gone to town with those tools. Absolutely. Heidi, a quick follow-up for you. How, how do we hold those companies accountable? That's part of the problem. So how do we um, approach that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a range of things to be done. I, I think it's incumbent, and a lot of this is happening in the civil rights community, for example, to put aggressive pressure on the companies to follow their own rules. And that means research that exposes the kind of things like Devin was just saying about the COVID conspiracies, you know, actual public protests, appeals to legislators. We really have to make these companies do what they say they're gonna do, which is not support hateful content. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also a lot about talking to um, our mm -hmm. representatives, our elected representatives about reasonable ways to deal with content regulation that doesn't violate the, the First Amendment. 
Um, but if we don't speak out, I mean, the reason we have any content moderation at all right now is because people uh, did speak out about what was happening and actually changed the dialogue around the social media companies. I mean, if you were talking to the head of Twitter in 2016 and said to them, there's going to be a day when you'll take a president off your system for saying hateful things, they would have said, are you crazy? We're libertarian. We allow anything to flourish here. We're, we're at least not having that debate. But we're a long way from having serious solutions. Right. Thank you, Heidi. Um, Hassan, um, you know, it feels like we're a little stuck and we need to expand the allyship and convince GOP moderates and other folks, um, center right folks, to disavow the white nationalist elements of this movement so we can make real progress on immigration reform. So, what would that take? That's a very large question that probably goes way beyond my pay grade, but I will take uh, uh, make a valiant effort at taking okay. a stab here. Um, I, <clears throat> I think the first step is given the fact that the uh, the Tantan Network, which is as we've uh, as we're establishing here, is responsible for so much of the discourse around immigration what's not told and what they're actively trying to hide or camouflage is their absolutely bold, a bald faced racist and eugenicist, uh, you know, connections or ideology. Um, you know, this is a, a group, this is a man, Tanton himself, who took money from the Pioneer Fund, an actual eugenicist or Nazi research outfit that tried to prove uh, through pseudoscience that white people are genetically superior uh, to members of other races. Um, so the first step has to be education, right? To not let the Tanta network off the hook. Um, it needs to be pointed out. Their ideology needs to be pointed out. Uh, Rins repeat. Educating members of Congress and, and state and local elected officials uh, to purge this narrative of, that's been pushed by the Tanta network, uh, you know, for so long now uh, that immigrants are a, uh, are a threat to national security, that they're here to steal jobs, that it's not economically beneficial, that, it's, um, that they're overpopulating the country, that it's bad for the environment. All of these, these, uh, these uh, framings uh, that, that have been put forth by the Tantan Network um, uh, you know, need to be called out you know, for what they are. That has to be the first step. Um, but it needs to go a step further uh, the current state of our immigration law uh, is ruinous. It's, uh, it's a nightmare. And I say this as a practicing attorney, uh, policies birthed or nurtured by the Tanta network. I have to fight nearly every single day as a practitioner. Um, and they've been able to hide and escape accountability for their, uh, and they, I mean the Tanta network, um, and those that they have uh, allied themselves with have been able to escape a lot of accountability. Once they're held to task on that, that narrative needs to be purged and replaced, okay, with uh, uh, a narrative of a more holistic, uh, humanistic narrative of giving people an actual chance, right? This is tie it to a national identity of a prosperous America, really the most secure border. People keep talking about border security. It's another big uh, talking point to the Tantan Network. And there's no doubt that border security is important. But think about what the most secure border is. It's the one where people on both sides are able to move freely. Ideas, goods, services, and people are allowed to move freely in both directions, right? And there's prosperity on both sides. It's the inequality across borders which is exacerbated by Tanta network rhetoric and policy that causes the problem. So the most secure border is the most prosperous border. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hassan. And to be fair to Hassan, I'd like to ask Devin uh, the same question. Um, in your, uh, your thoughts on how do we expand allyship, bring GOP moderates and center-right folks into the conversation, and um, convince more folks to disavow these ideologies. I think we start from a place, and I think Hassan was absolutely right about this. Uh, I think we start from a place that this isn't really a conversation about immigrants. 
This isn't about immigrants at all. It's really a question about who and what we are as a nation in the 21st century, mm -hmm. right? Whether or not we're going to live up to the ideals upon which this country was founded, you know, the kind of democratic, multiracial, multi-ethnic, pluralistic democracy that we've always been striving towards, or if we're going to let, you know, the, the voices of hate and division divide us and take us into a society that is more exclusive, that is more dangerous, that is more, um, exclusive uh, for those who don't look like what, what these folks think America looks like. Mm -hmm. I think that if by having the conversations about who and what we are as a nation, I think it allows us to begin reclaiming some of that ground. And that means we begin by um, working to decouple these groups from the mainstream by pushing them back from the mainstream back into the margins where they can talk to each other all they want, um, but we don't let their ideas have political or social or cultural relevance uh, in the way that it does today. It means working with foundations and other groups to defund these organizations, uh, to realize that their money is actually going uh, for something way different than they claim. And you know, speaking of funding, I wanted to go back a little bit to what Hassan was talking about in terms of the Tent Networks funding by the Pioneer Fund. Yeah. The report we have coming out next year shows that that funding, which was a total of nearly $1.3 million from the 1980s to the early 1990s, was, influ was extremely important for the Tent Network. And but for that funding, from an organization created in 1938 to promote Hitlerian notions of eugenics and race science. But for that funding, the Tanton Network might not exist today. It was the organization that moved them from a small, scrappy grassroots organization to a massive network and institution that has changed public policy for many years. So that's some of what we have to continue to do to allow people to understand that those are the types of groups that they're supporting when they give their money through, um, through the various uh, foundations. And the foundations have accountability in that as well. And then I think there's that larger societal question about what we do to help redefine who and what we are as a nation, to embrace our welcoming tradition, uh, to live up to the ideals ensconced on the Statue of Liberty, and push back against the ideas that want to divide us against one another and make it harder for us to you know, live happy, healthy, prosperous lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Devin. Uh, a similar question to, to Heidi, uh, somewhat similar. So this is the first time in our history that our surveillance systems have directly named white supremacy as the greatest and most pressing threat of terrorism to the American people. And yet here we are with hate groups on the rise, um, the GOP pandering to conspiracy theories and, more, and people more divided than ever. Um, what should our movement be doing differently or do more of to counter this, this growth? Yeah, that is sadly where we, where we find ourselves today, right? Mm -hmm. and the issue of, of immigration is in, incredibly polarized. So the question that you asked Hassan about what to do with, um, you know, building bridges across partisan divides on this issue is yeah. so much worse and so much more difficult than it was not that long ago. I mean, it's almost hard to believe that Ronald Reagan, you know, legalized more than a million undocumented folks. I mean, you can't even imagine that happening today. I mean, I, th I think Devin and Hassan have already talked about some of the things that need to happen. We need to have a, a more salient, sober conversation about what this country is actually about. Uh, it's so weird to me that we have turned against the Statue of Liberty's um, view of the United States mm -hmm. to something that is very much more in line, for example, with the highly clan backed Immigration Act of 1924 that was so inherently um, racist. We, we aren't even very much aligned on the idea that 
white supremacy is the number one domestic terrorist threat in the country. I mean, this is that's what the FBI said. That's what the De Department of Homeland Security has said and many other intelligence agencies. And yet there is very little will on the right side of the aisle to actually take that seriously. And in fact, the Biden administration's attempts to put in place an agenda around that issue have been made difficult. For example, the military, which should be expelling white supremacists from its ranks, can't even agree on a definition of what extremist is. And this has been going on for six months. And, and so, you know, I feel like right now the country is going through sort of a battle for its soul that has been played in the past before of welcoming errors, eras, and eras in which immigrants were essentially punished for being here and discriminated against. And I think it's going to take everybody in this space and who cares about these issues speaking out and, you know, hearkening to what the importance of a diverse democracy is and what it means for America and how good it's been for this country, for us to get on the right path. But it's going to be a battle. And the Trump administration certainly turned, uh, you know, took many, many steps backward from that and from civil rights agendas. And, and, it, and that backsliding didn't stop when he left office. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's going to be a continuing fight. Absolutely. Thank you, Heidi. Um, Hassan, if you could just kind of building on Heidi's point about um, the Trump administration and our transition now to a new administration, how has that, how has your practice changed, become more difficult, more complex, both during the Trump years and what are you seeing now uh, with the clients you serve? There have been some, um, some positive changes, um, but I'm disappointed. Mm. I'm just gonna say it. Uh, I'm disappointed. Uh, I, uh, it's been, you know, almost a year at this point. And um, the fact that uh, uh, Title 42 is still being used to, to expel people seeking uh, to exercise their human right to seek asylum, uh, the restarting and somewhat expansion of the migrant, uh, uh, sorry, I was going to say migrant persecution protocols that might be more apt, accurate anyway. Uh, migrant MPP, the MPP program. Um, while there have been some, you know, and I do want to give due credit uh, for uh, things such as re, uh, giving administrative uh, uh, docket control back to immigration judges and uh, vacating some of the really more noxious anti-asylum and anti-immigrant decisions that came out of the Board of Immigration Appeals over the last four years. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so that there have been some, some positive things that have happened, but overall, um, I think that the, the, the discourse on immigration and the, uh, the actual policies that are coming out um, remain subject to political whim. That's, uh, uh, that's one big problem. And the second big problem is there's not enough of a counterwind or countervailing force to reverse the systemic damage that was done to the system over the last four years. Um, I had high hopes, I really did. I had really high hopes um, that we would see a lot more positive change. I, I don't think it's necessarily the fault of the people who have, are working in the administration. Uh, I want to give uh, the benefit of the doubt uh, where possible. And I'm also not under any illusions about the sheer enormity of the task. As somebody who's been practicing immigration law for almost 20 years, I know how arcane it is. I know how difficult it is. And there have been really nitty gritty examples that I can give you of policies that have been, that have been reversed, um, but it's not working yet. We need a systemic change and that's gonna require a narrative change. And that is gonna require these anti-immigrant white nationalist networks to be put back to the margins where they belong. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, Devin, what would you consider sort of the, the key battlegrounds when it comes to defeating uh, nativist forces, and how and how can we mobilize support in those in those battleground states to defeat um, those efforts? You know, that's a great question. Um, before I get to that, I want to just circle back for a second to what Hassan said. I think he was being pretty diplomatic. Um, when he said he was disappointed, I'll tell you I'm angry. 
I, I, I am angry at the continued uh, lip service paid to immigration reform and the inability to deliver. I'm angry because uh, lawmakers have seen to do that. Yeah. I'm also angry that we haven't pushed hard enough to continue to move that. Yeah. I'm angry because I believe this, that lip service is the kiss of death, both because you pay the political price by mobilizing anti-immigrant forces around a message they can galvanize upon, and you don't deliver anything for those who support you. That's both uh, energizing for the bad folks and demoralizing for those who folks who support your message. So I'm really beyond disappointed at this point. Uh, and I hope to see much more coming, both from policymakers and from those of us, you know, who are concerned about immigrants' rights to push for a further, uh, you know, a, for our agenda to be moved further along. I think right now the battlegrounds are going to be both social and political. We've got to do the groundwork now um, and thinking about what's happening heading into the next electoral cycle. We already know, looking at both ad buys and from some of the on the ground activism that we've seen in the COVID denial circles, for instance, that anti-immigrant sentiment is going to be a key part of those political campaigns and those political notions. We're not a political organization, you know, we're a 501c3, so we don't directly deal on those fronts, but those areas are where I pay attention to, those battleground issues where folks like Chris Kobach are running again for office, where anti-immigrant activists are mobilizing to use these ideas in campaigns. And it means that those of us who are concerned have to speak out, have to try to uh, re-marginalize those ideas and reclaim the moral high ground and not allow them to continue to push us around on the political, social, or cultural fields. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move into Q and A uh, real quick because I see quite a bit of questions are coming in. Um, so, this feels like a good time to transition to that. And then I'll come back to our panelists for some closing thoughts. But for this question, I think I'll pose to Heidi. Um, the question reads, predictions are always fraught, but where do you think the nativist movement is headed over the next year? And are there trends that are new um, on the way from the margins to the mainstream? Well, I think Devin actually just hinted on this and what's coming politically. You know, we have midterm elections in 2022, and there's going to be a whole host of candidates who are, I mean, we're already seeing this, who are going to use immigration as the wedge issue to get elected. So I expect the conversation over immigration to be more fraught, to see more hate injected into those discussions, and a lot of um, very bad stuff online. Um, unfortunately, we're in a situation where one political party is using that particular issue mm. in a way to mobilize. And it's, it, we've, we're seeing this all across the Western world, actually, by far right populist parties keying on specifically on immigration um, as a way to mobilize. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have good news on this front. I just think things are going to get worse mm. over the coming months. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, a question for, for Hassan. And this questioner indicates they are not pro-deportation, but they would like to know if not deportation, what alternatives do you propose? I wanna go ahead and actually, uh, um, I mean, it's a, I actually wrote an op-ed for The Hill back in 2017 on this, on this issue. Um, I'll, I'll quickly summarize it and then I'm happy to actually post a link here if, uh, if that can be done if people want to read a little bit more. The bottom line is, is that there's a long line of Supreme Court cases, okay, that going back to the, uh, the early 1900s that talk about deportation as the strongest medicine. It is supposed to be something that is used seldomly. And uh, what's happened over the years is that it's become easier and easier to break increasingly strict immigration laws to the point where sometimes it's impossible to comply with them. 
uh, for example, somebody trying to apply for a green card has to go into an interview to uh, uh, check the validity of their marriage and they're picked up by ICE and not allowed the chance to apply for, for the green card that they're, that they're entitled to apply for. I mean, we immigration lawyers hear this type of, of railroading all the time for our clients and it's a, it's a nightmare to deal with. Um, what the law has historically recognized as strong medicine is now available over the counter. So what I mean to say rethinking deporta deportation as a panacea or even a prerequisite towards fixing our immigration system, first of all, it's important to understand that deportation is not automatic. There's actually a great deal of time and money and resources that have to be spent to physically remove someone from the United States. Um, and the second thing is, is that, um, uh, is that uh, uh, historically, there have been uh, fines that can be levied. There have been uh, periods of time, provisional status, you know, that could be given to somebody before they're allowed to apply for citizenship. Um, and uh, there used to be, before the Tantum Network got involved, uh, a way for people to leave and try again. So unfortunately, the way the law is right now, uh, compliance is all but impossible, right? So you can't, you can't uh, have a system that uh, essentially creates the problem that it's trying to solve and then offers more of what, uh, of what it's trying to do in order to solve that problem. And that's this, uh, the problem that we're having now. By assuming that every single immigration law has to lead to deportation and that it's somehow always uh, the, uh, the immigrants or the, my, my client's fault you know, for, uh, for not being able to comply with the law without looking to see what options they actually had. Did they have a line to wait in? Was there an option? Uh, was it unfairly taken away from them? Did they actually have due process before their family was, uh, uh, was uprooted or before they were uprooted from the, the country they've come to call home? These are serious questions that need to be, uh, need to be looked at and deportation needs to be relegated to the strong medicine that the Supreme Court said it was uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Um, another question that came in, um, I guess I'll pose this to Devin or Heidi. Uh, the questioner says the anti-immigrant movement, is the anti-immigrant movement only coming from white people and nationalists? Um, are there any insights on uh, immigrants who may be against further immigration or other um, other sources of, op of op opposition, um, or is this just purely a, a movement of white supremacy? At its core, ideologically, it's a movement of white supremacy, um, hands down. Mm -hmm. That said, um, there have been attempts by the Tanton Network to fund and create organizations that give the veneer of support for different communities. For instance, back in the 2000s, there was a group called the Diversity Alliance for Sustainable America, led by a, a Vietnamese immigrant. Um, there was, for a while in the early 2000s, a group called Choose Black America, which was a group of, you know, a small group of African American folks funded by the Tent Network to try to drive a wedge between the African American community and, uh, you know, and new immigrants. Um, there have been these repeated front groups and efforts to try to give the illusion that there is mass support uh, on the anti immigrant side from different uh, new from different immigrants communities and from, uh, you know, and from other folks of color. Um, but those things have often tended to be, you know, a, a front groups that are illusions, right, to try to continue that facade. Um, that said, it doesn't mean we don't have work to do in communities who are who have you know of, of first and second generation immigrants uh, to also continue to stand up and help us in the work to redefine who and what we are as a nation uh, to live out to those democratic ideals. It's a challenge, and if we, I think about it this way, if we're not reaching those folks, they're vulnerable for someone else too. So it requires us to speak to everyone, to find new constituents and new ways to reach people. You know, I think about the folks in 
Kansas City, for instance, who are doing immigrants rights works with folks who are also engaged in the fight for $15 an hour minimum wage amongst fast food workers. They're both, you know, making sure that those folks understand the centrality of their fights together and are working in solidarity on issues and are now sharing the stage which, with one another and are working uh, cross movements and um, doing so both to isolate potential anti-immigrant sentiment in the immigrants' rights work and also helping the immigrants' rights folk understand the importance of solidarity of the work that they're doing for $15 an hour and a minimum wage. So those kind of things are I'm you know, hopeful about in, in the face of all this horrible dreck we've talked about today, there are some hopeful signs about those building new and different ways in which approaching this that don't allow those kind of front group efforts to you know, pull the, the wool over the eyes of the American public. Mm, thank you, Devin. And just a, a quick reminder to folks that we go until 2.15 Eastern, so we have a little bit of time for more questions, um, closing thoughts, and then we'll, um, we'll wrap up. So um, I, I see a question here. I'm going to pose this question to Heidi. The question reads, some people will argue that those anti-immigrant groups, however hateful, are exercising their right to free speech. What do you say to those people? Well, I mean, look, they are exercising their right to free speech. My concern is more about their access to platforms that expand their reach because the way those online platforms exist, right? So I'm not so concerned about FAIR putting something up on its website, although I might not like that. Uh, what I am concerned about is having that material picked up and proliferated, for example, in some kind of a political ad that um, bashes immigrants. So, you know, and, our, and a lot of times people say, well, oh my God, you know, taking material down from social media and whatnot is violating the First Amendment. It is not. The First Amendment is about the government restricting speech. It's not about an online platform making the decision not to host free, you know, some kind of horrible speech. Just like we don't expect a restaurant to have to allow a Klansman to come in and preach their hate. Neither does Facebook have to allow that kind of material. So that's, you know, that's ultimately what, what my concern is. Yes, they have free speech. So does the worst neo-Nazi in the world to say the most heinous things they want, shy of directly threatening someone in this country. But we don't have to allow our online ecosystem to exist to proliferate and expand the reach and, and send the stuff around and get it injected into our political system. That's the real problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heidi. Um, another question that I'll just kind of pose generally um, to any of you. In light of what was shared here and what is happening at the federal policy level, uh, particularly with the reconciliation process, how can our alliances and group and uh, regroup or pivot? Um, should we focus on the Senate races, um, the Tanton ecosystem? Where should our focus be right now? To any of you, perhaps starting with Hassan. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I'm a big believer in the 80-20 principle, uh, the Pareto principle. Um, and I, I think that the way that we need to approach, there's always gonna be fires, fires to put out. Um, but if we don't help direct our allies and say, hey, at least 20%, or maybe even less, of your time and resources needs to understand where all this torrent of hate is actually coming from um, uh, to unify that messaging around uh, uh, at least exposing and purging this hateful dialogue, this hateful narrative uh, from our policy discussion. We might not agree on what uh, a humane immigration system might look like. There's certainly a lot of valid disagreements even amongst my own colleagues, right? Uh, people that are that are working, you know, for immigrants directly, you know, in the trenches, so to speak. Uh, but we all should be able to at least agree that white nationalism has no space, no place in our um, in our immigration policy. Um, so in terms of, of, of working with, as I said before, I think it's important to uh, to, to focus. Uh, and uh, to, to focus on those, uh, the, the, the quote unquote malleable middle, uh, there are certain people that will never listen to this message and that's fine. 
uh, but uh, uh, to focus on those who at least may be open, who at least may be open to understanding that, hey, maybe some of these ideas that you've been pushing, um, do you know where they came from? Hmm. You know, how dangerous is it actually? Do you understand what it is that you're actually, what you're actually post? And it can be a, a conversation behind closed doors. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to say is that it's important for each of us to spend time with elected officials so that they understand, you know, where all of this is actually coming from. Um, and um, without purging that space, um, it's going to continue to get dragged down uh, and, and slowed down and inhibited uh, the way it has been for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hassan. Um, the last question I'm seeing feels like a good place to kind of uh, wrap up our thoughts. And I, so I'd love to get um, thoughts from Heidi and Devin on this question. Uh, maybe starting with Devin, because it touches a little bit on the funding and, and uh, you made a point earlier that these some of these organizations wouldn't even exist were it not for the money that kind of propped them up. Um, the question reads, the other side has a well-organized, well-funded head start, which allows it to pounce on any opportunity um, as we've seen during the Trump administration. What are the obstacles to the anti-hate, pro-diversity, pro-immigration organizing? Um, what are the obstacles that prevent it from gaining strength? And what do we need to do to improve our organizing and countering their message? So I'd love to hear from Devin and Heidi, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Go ahead, Devin. Well, I think that... Um... I'm not, you know, I'm not going to speak to the ins and outs of what the immigrants rights movement is doing in terms of the the specifics of this, uh, you know, and the current policy fight, because I think that they're engaged in a noble effort to try to change it for the better under really difficult circumstances. But I'm often reminded of the uh, words of one of IREHR's original mentors, uh, C.T. Vivian, uh, you know, Dr. King's right hand man. Uh, throughout the civil rights era, who sadly left us uh, last year. Uh, you know, he, one of the first times I met him, he reminded me that the work of bending the moral arc towards justice is a marathon, not a sprint. That um, far too often we, that we spend time and resources and institutional efforts on short-term policy pronouncements or putting out uh, political fires, rather than thinking about a long-term vision for societal change um, and investing in that kind of change. John Tanton, when you read through his archives, as Hassan and I and Heidi have done, um, had a plan, a 50-year plan for changing the United States. We're lacking that kind of vision on our side of how, over the next five decades, we live up to our democratic ideals and we protect those things. So I think that means investing in institutions that are looking at the long term, that are investing in things that are outside of the purview of the kind of internecine policy fights in Washington and are taking on those larger, broader questions of who and what we are, both in the political social and cultural spaces. And in doing so, you can build a movement over time that's going to change these impacts. Um, not to say that those movement activities aren't there. Uh, I know that the immigrants rights movement has done amazing stuff and I will con you know, will continue to be a part of that drive for effort. But I also think that, you know, particularly for foundations and other philanthropic organizations, far too often they're, funding the last battles rather than looking ahead to the new ones. And that, I think, is a paradox that puts us always behind the eight ball. Mm. Thank you, Devin. Heidi, take us home with your quick thoughts on that same question. <laughs> well, I can't compete with C.T. Vivian. And I, look, I mean, Devin said exactly what I would say. I agree completely. John Tanton, who is like, you know, I feel like is the great nemesis of the world, was a very smart strategic thinker. And he did think long-term and he actually thought about creating a movement, not just one institution that would get wealthy and powerful, a range of institutions, a whole, he conceived of an entire world that of course is the exact opposite of anything I want to ever see happen. So I'm just going to second the things that Devin talked about. We often think too short-term philanthropic efforts, fighting the last battle or even a few battles before or only putting money in your 
pocket to work on something that'll last six months. You know, we have to be a lot more strategic and maybe we can learn something from Tanton by thinking about what do we want America to look like in 25 years? And what would that mean for everybody who is concerned about civil rights, human rights, you know, humane immigration policies, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I'm hearing that we need to work together in concert, working in alliance, thinking long-term, being strategic. And all of us on this panel are part of a coalition of organizations that's um, working collaboratively to delegitimize and defund and decouple the anti-immigrant movement from its sources of power. So we are really at the end of our time, but I would like to invite our guests and listeners to connect with us any of the organizations that you see in this panel to connect with Mayor Alliance. If there are questions we didn't get to, I apologize, um, but we can always connect you with any of the panelists if you still looking for answers to those questions, we're happy to do that. Um, so this has been a powerful discussion and I'd like to thank all of you for participating and for your, for the, to the audience for their questions. And I'd like to thank our guests, Devin Burkhard, Heidi Byrick and Hassan Ahmad for the important work that you all are doing. And so um, with that, I will pass it back to Cynthia Greenberg. Thank you so much, Lola. And on behalf of all of us here at the National Partnership for New Americans and the National Immigrant Integration Conference, just wanna extend our great thanks to all of you for sharing your expertise during today's really critical conversation. Um, we're really proud to partner with Mira Alliance and also with Unidos US on today's discussion. And we wanna invite everyone who has been able to join us today, if you'd like to access a recording of this or any of the prior post-NIC webinars, which we've been hosting over the last weeks, those are, will be available on our YouTube YouTube channel, and I believe the link to that will be posted in the chat just now. But uh, again, from all of us, thank you so much. We're wishing everyone a safe and healthy close to the year. We've got a, um, some big fights ahead of us um, in, in the months ahead. So take good care. Thank you again so much for joining us. And many thanks, especially to our expert panelists today for, your, for sharing your insights um, and, and thinking with us all. Thank you all. <laughs>